Hi, I am a researcher in the theory of condensed matter group, which is part of the Cavendish Laboratory of the University of Cambridge. We are theoretical physicists doing research on condensed matter physics. In this presentation, I'll tell you what condensed matter is and how we do theoretical research about it. But before, let me remind you how research in physics works with a simple story. Take for example Newton's theory of gravity. Newton himself said several times that he was inspired by looking at an apple falling from a tree. Now, suppose you are Newton, and you want to learn something about gravity. You go on top of a skyscraper and you let an apple fall. Then, you simply measure the distance the apple has fallen after a certain time. You find that after one second it fell 5 meters, after 220, and so on. Since you are a physicist, you wonder if there is any pattern in the data. You stare at it for a while, and you realize that 20 is 5 times 4, 45 5 times 9, 85 times 16 and so on. You also realize that 4, 9 and 16 are the squares of 2, 3 and 4. You just found that the distance always equals 5, times the square of the time. Fantastic! But still, there's many things you don't understand. When is this true? What is 5? What if I do the experiment in another place? You go on the opposite side of the world, repeat the experiment, and you find the same formula. What if you change object? You take your heavy backpack full of books, and you drop it. Can't believe it. You find the same formula again. This is very strange, you thought the backpack fell much faster than the apple. But hey, you just found that the formula works everywhere and for completely different objects. It's unbelievable, isn't it? Yet, that 5 still bothers you so much. Oh, right, now you get it. 5 is just 10 divided by 2. Wow, you have just discovered Newton's theory of gravity. 10 is about the value of the gravitational acceleration, it is called g in your physics book. This is what physicists call a theory. It agrees with your previous experiments, but importantly, it allows to make new predictions. Theories of physics are very powerful. Indeed, by refining the theory of gravity a little bit, you can work out the trajectory of cannonballs, calculate the orbits of planets, and send rockets and satellites into space. You can do it. Of course, there's much more science packed in those objects, but still the working principles are simple gravity calculations. Now that we have an idea of what a theory of physics is, let's move to the next question. What is condensed matter physics? Condensed matter physics deals with things made of very many particles. These interact together by means of some forces, such that they remain close to each other. Also often these particles are so small that they obey the laws of quantum mechanics. Can you think of any example? Solids and liquids are made of atoms or molecules bind by electromagnetic forces. A gas instead is not a condensed phase of matter, as there's no force keeping its atoms together in one place. But why are we interested in studying bunches of atoms? What can these possibly do? One important example is that they can conduct electricity. Electricity in fact was one of the first phenomena studied in condensed matter physics. Something about it was known from ancient times, but only in the 19th century it was understood so well to make it useful. Yet a very basic question was left unanswered. Why do some materials like iron conduct electricity, while others like wood don't? It was only with the advent of quantum mechanics, in the 1930s, that physicists understood it, with the band theory of conductivity. Here is another example of what condensed matter physics made possible. Electronics. We're all very familiar with computers and smartphones, but do you know what is the main brick of electronics? The transistor. This is a very small circuit that works more or less like a switch. The transistor allowed to go from computers that look like that to those that we have today. Transistors are much smaller than vacuum tubes used earlier, allowing to pack billions of them in the size of a smartphone, achieving computational powers that were simply impossible before. Yet an even more sophisticated example. This is a magnetic resonance machine. It is used in hospitals to take images of our bodies, the brain for example. To make it work one needs extremely strong magnetic fields, and that's what that ring is made for. Inside there are coils of wires, that generate a magnetic field when a current is passed through them. Except, if you made them with a normal metal, the currents would be so strong that everything would melt down. To avoid that, they are made with superconductors. These are very strange states of matter with special quantum properties. They can generate very high magnetic fields, because they can conduct electricity without losses, that is they don't heat up. They do all sorts of strange things, including, levitating. The catch is that they need to be cooled down a lot to maintain these properties, usually using liquid nitrogen or helium that generates the fog that to see here. For this reason, they can't be used in many other applications. Well, 
unless we discover new superconductors that work at higher temperatures. I hope I've convinced you that a bunch of atoms can do a lot. In fact, there are countless many more applications of condensed matter physics in technology. Now we know what condensed matter physics is. But how is theoretical research about it done nowadays in the labs? Let's consider for example your first research project in theoretical physics, say during your physics undergrad. You reach out a more senior researcher and discuss with them of some topics to which you could contribute. You read about the latest discoveries in the field in scientific journals and keep discussing, until you come up with an interesting question that nobody has already answered. Once you've identified the question, you ask how you can tell something about it using maths. This involves simplifying your problem down to its most essential ingredients, such that it can be described by simple enough mathematical equations. The next step is to find a solution of those equations, which can be done either by hand or using computers. The solution gives you a theoretical prediction about the physical phenomenon you are studying. An essential step is then to compare your prediction with reality, performing an experiment. This is usually done by someone else, as theory and experiments are complicated enough that a single person cannot do both. If your prediction agrees with the experiment, then you've learnt something new about nature. If it doesn't, then more work is needed. Throughout the process, you write scientific papers to share your findings with colleagues across the world. Finally, let's make a concrete example of a physical phenomenon, and discuss how it can be described mathematically. For this, we'll talk about the laser. While this is not the most typical example of a condensed matter system, it is still composed of several atoms inside a material, that interact with each other's, and with light. The first laser was built in 1960, after as long as 50 years of theoretical work. Lasers are used in many applications, such as laser printers, barcode scanners, or for eye surgery, where it is used to precisely sew up damaged retinas. A laser can be essentially understood as the light generated by an ensemble of atoms interacting with each other. In fact, an important property of atoms is that, if they are given some energy, for example from a battery, they can store it momentarily, we call them excited atoms. This energy can then be released by the atoms in the form of light. Inside a laser you also have some mirrors that essentially select the direction of the laser beam that is let out by a hole into one of them. The physical principle that allows the laser to operate is called stimulated emission. This was discovered by Einstein and corresponds to the fact that the presence of some light nearby stimulates excited atoms to emit more light. This produces a cascade process, similar to that of an atomic bomb, for which more and more light is generated. Let's now construct a mathematical model of the laser. We first define the mathematical variables that represent physical quantities, such as R for the injected energy, or kappa for the light escaping from other directions. In terms of these variables, laser operation can be described by the following equation. It describes how the intensity of light N changes in time. The principle of stimulated emission is represented here by the first term in the square brackets. One way to solve this equation is to translate it in a small computer program, as the one shown here. The solution of the equation teaches us something about the laser. There is a minimal amount of energy that needs to be provided by the battery to initiate the cascade process that makes the laser work. This is called laser threshold. Here is a graph of the intensity of light versus time for a too small amount of energy provided. In this case a finite intensity present initially decreases to zero for larger times and the laser turns off. A very different behavior is instead found if the energy provided is larger than the laser threshold. Here we see that the initial light increases and reaches a non-zero value. The laser is now working. In this presentation, I've told you something about condensed matter physics and its many applications. I tried to give an idea of what it is like doing theoretical research in this field, and showed an example of a mathematical model of a laser. I hope you enjoyed it.